The Frozen North, Episode 64, our top five side-scrollers. Welcome to episode number 64 of the Frozen North Gaming Podcast. My name is JJ. My name is Mark. And I'm Brian. That was boring. Thanks, Mark. Uh, how do well, you all Wait. Wow. Well, hold on. Boring? Um, this is coming from the guy who does play Farmville. Maybe he's it's starting to like, right. bring him... I would imagine playing a game that's based on farming would turn him into more of a... Of a howdy, y'all? You know, yeah. Gotcha. Mark? Man, that's a stereotype. Is it? That's a, that's a stereotype. Not everyone that... Farms. It's all the other howdy. farmers you know don't do that. Not all the other Farmville players I know don't <laughs> say howdy. How many other Farmville players do you know? Do you guys like have like a? Are you guys on a meetup? We we have a clan. Clan what? We compete to see who can get the most apples. What's yes. the name? What's the name of the clan? Some some, some pun that I can't think of. Right now. Gotcha. <laughs> some pun that I can't think of right now. It's the same name. <laughs> oh man! So how you guys doing? What have we been playing lately? Uh, Shan has been playing Zelda, Oracle of Ages. You mean the game you're I've, supposed to I've be playing? Been, I've been playing Rust. Oh, I, I didn't see you play Rust. I well, I did spy Mark playing some Rust this weekend. Yeah, they've uh, they've added a lot of new features to Rust. They've got horses in there now. The procedurally generated maps now have roads, power lines, street signs, and other things like that in them as well. And all the barrels that have loot now spawn just along those roads. <laughs> Oh, nice. So you can kind of know exactly where you need to go to get items, but that's also where everyone's going to go to kill you. Of course. So, so it's it's pretty cool. A lot of new changes. It's, it's a much more well-rounded game now. Interesting. You were supposed to be playing Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages. I, I outsourced And you it. got scared and let your girlfriend play it yes. again. So <laughs> I'm a little, like, amnesia I get because I was freaked out, too. Yeah. But Zelda... Zelda's I mean, a scary game. It's it's not. When you, get, not? Nope. when you get to the room before the boss and you can hear the boss. Like in that remember in Zelda. You when hadn't you could gotten hear? to a boss fight and you gave it to her. Well, I knew it was gonna get, scare me eventually. <laughs> okay. It that was preemptive sense. it was preemptive measures. Typical Mark. Typical Mark. Unbelievable. Are you gonna play Oracle of Ages? Mm. Wait, you said you got to the, the first dungeon eventually, didn't you? Yeah, I beat the first dungeon. Oh, okay. I uh did you find the second one? Because I know you're having issues. I found Nehru's house, and I have the Harp of Ages? Mm-hmm. Time Harp? Yep. And I think I, that's the last thing I needed to go to the next dungeon. Because I got to the dungeon, and it's like, oh, I pulled this rock up, and it like went into the ground. Right. So. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. Dungeons aren't too bad. It's literally the hardest part about that game is finding your way between. Yeah, it's a dungeons. lot less yep. open than you're gonna need. You're going to need an FAQ eventually because I, I, unless I wanted to spend you know countless hours uh, walking around the entire world over and over and over again, I yeah, you know, yeah, nope. yeah, the overworld's the tough one. Uh, but it's still a good game. So, you bet. Uh, Brian, a uh, whole lot of Witcher three. I'm trying to get Witcher 3 beat before uh, Batman Arkham Knight drops, because I'm going to play that as soon as it hits. Um, so that's the majority of the game I've been playing. Obviously, Oracle of Seasons. I think I'm on the seventh uh, dungeon. I'm heading to it. I've got all the seasons now in my rod, so I can control the whole shebang, all four seasons, um, and make uh, make it bend to my will. Nice. Yeah, and then uh, just a little bit of a smattering of Batman Blackgate, which is, funny enough, a side-scroller, a Metroidvania side scroller pretty cool okay uh i actually i've been playing quite a bit i beat the witcher one mm-hmm. which er <laughs> Man. Uh. i if you remember we we talked about it a while ago we did a review on it and i i didn't recommend it because i uh well a i hadn't beaten it yet but because it was so hard to get into and it, the pacing is so terrible i still feel the same way i can't i mean I recommend it if you're looking for a decent story, but at the same time, probably about 50% of the story does not even need to be in there. Yep. It's it's completely like just tacked on and worthless. The combat is kind of slow, and the game itself, 
It's one of those where you you play it and you can totally see the genius in what they're trying to do, um, which is awesome because they're you know they've got two and three. I can't wait to dive into two because of what one showed me they had the potential to do. Yep. So I'm excited to to, to get into that. Um, yep. I also finished Dragon Quest One. Started my foray into that series. Finally, well, Dragon Warrior Dragon One, I Warrior, guess I should say. Yeah. <laughs> Rough and tumble. It was very, very, like, man, I've said this before, like, especially when I beat Fantasy Star 1. First of all, I love playing those old games, you know, where I can say I beat a piece of gaming history. And, you know, Dragon Warrior 1 certainly is a huge piece of gaming history, especially in the JRPG world. And, first of all, there's no bosses, except for the final boss. It's the same in in Dragon Quest 2, which I'm playing now and almost done with. But... It's just one big grind fest. That's all it is. You're literally like, you can go pretty much anywhere right off the bat, but you basically have to grind in each area, level up, and get strong enough, buy new gear and stuff to get to the next area and survive there. So it's, I don't know, if you don't like those grinding games, I played it on my Game Boy Advance, which was perfect because I could just, you know, pop in Netflix and just go to town on on monsters on there. But, uh, man... Kudos to anybody who beat that stuff without a guide, because there are like it's like go find this item that's out in the middle of the desert on one of the pixelated blocks that's there that you can walk over. We're not going to give you any hints. Uh, there might be one guy in a town who's like, yeah, it's in the desert south of here. <laughs> oh, sweet! So I got to cover like you know a hundred spaces where I have to right. look in each one. So I, I definitely had a fat candy for that one, and the second one that I'm playing through right now, which is which honestly improves on the game in every way. Uh, which which has been a uh, a real cool little trip down gaming history lane. Oh, and uh, I also got to hang out at SoPro uh, yeah. yesterday. I, I I will be the first to tell you I am not a big League of Legends guy. I've never played it myself. I've watched it plenty of times, um, and I know I I've played uh, Heroes of the Storm enough to know kind of how the basic mechanics work and what you're supposed to do and all this stuff. But it's so. <sighs> Honestly, from what I was seeing, it seems a heck of a lot more complicated than Heroes of the Storm. Heroes of the Storm is very, very basic, which is nice because it's easy for somebody like me to get into. It was just like, some of the stuff these people were doing was was insane. They had a big tournament there, and just getting to sit around and watch, there was probably like, I'd say at one point, 40 to 50 people in this in this building. Wow. Um, and I mean, you guys have been there, you've seen the size yeah. of it, and it's a good yep. sized building, but still 40 to 50 people in there is is insane. And they haven't even officially opened yet, so it's kind of like... Dang, dude! You know, like what's what's the future going to hold if they keep doing stuff like this? Yep. Yeah. But they they also they did want me to uh, t- Tony the uh, the one of the owners of the place who we talked to him and Lee mm-hmm. a couple episodes ago wanted me to mention that they are going to be opening this week, and I think I think Wednesday is when he said. So just just stop on by. They're they're going to be closed Mondays and Tuesdays. So Wednesday would be the first day right. they open. But uh, they're going to open up, see how things go. They'll be open at noon, and. Uh, so they're going to the be Kansas City area. They're going to be open. <clears throat> excuse me. They're going to be open Monday, or I'm sorry, Wednesday through Sunday. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yep. Yeah. So if you're in sense. the Kansas City area, come on down, man. I think uh, from what I saw, and I I could be wrong on this, but what I saw, it looks like they're doing every day other than Monday, Tuesday, obviously, open at noon till midnight, and then Friday and Saturdays till two a.m. Wow. So I think that I makes mean, a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Those are the days you want to stay up. Yep. And it was just, it was just cool to see so many people. I saw some uh, people I hadn't seen in a while. I got to just hang out and and I, I mean I wasn't even playing, but I was having such a good time. They had the uh, the the uh, matches streaming on Twitch, uh, but also on the uh, the TVs that they had all over the place. They just put in new couches, uh, DX racer chairs for every single console. I mean it, it's just it's awesome. Yeah, very very cool. So if you are around here, go check them out for sure. All right, if. You would like to email us? Where can they do that, Mark? Frozennorthpodcast at gmail.com. All right. Brian, what's our Twitter? Twitter's at FN Podcast. And our Facebook page, Mark? I don't know. Uh, Facebook.com slash Frozen North. <laughs> that was a guess. <laughs> yes, that is right. That's correct. <laughs> Facebook.com slash Frozen North. Uh, our blog is frozennorthpodcast.blogspot.com. <laughs> and we are on iTunes where we would appreciate it if you could go to subscribe and rate us on there. The more you rate us, the more we get to go and be seen by other people. Yeah. So it would be nice. We yeah, appreciate it. Absolutely. 
Okay, so we've been doing a contest for the past couple of weeks. Uh, well, past like month and a half. I yeah, think. We, we extended yep. it. And it was for SoPro promo cards. We, we're not 100% sure what that entails just yet, but uh, you're going to get something from SoPro. So uh, we'll, we'll see. And uh, also a grand prize of a $30 GameStop gift card. Yeah. So I'm not going to do, in the past when we've done contests, we've done drawings on the show. Just in the interest of time, we're not going to do that. I did the drawings beforehand. So I'm just going to go ahead and just read the names off. Go ahead, and I will also shoot you an email back uh, once I once once we get done and uh, we we have everything squared away. That way you can get it. If I don't get a response within like I'd say the next two weeks before the next episode or something, um, I'm probably going to go ahead and have to you know draw again and find somebody else. So just respond to me as soon as possible. We'll get your info and get you uh, get you squared away. Uh, the winner of uh, one of the SoPro promo, God, that's so weird to say, SoPro promo. SoPro promo. SoPro promo cards is uh, going to be Caden Morash. I hope I'm pronouncing that last name right. Morash, Morash. Just uh, like I said, look out for an email. I'll be sending one to you, and uh, we'll get we'll get stuff out to you for, uh, for SoPro. And uh, luckily enough, we did have a winner for the $30 gift card um, along with uh, the other SoPro gift card. To somebody who was in Kansas City. Wow. And it's actually somebody I know, which was kind of funny. Interesting. LJ Fisher. All right. Yeah, kind of cool. Uh, congrats, LJ. Congrats, Caden. Uh, we'll reach out to you and just get your info, and we'll get that all squared away. One other thing I wanted to announce, SoPro, like I said, they're going to be opening this next coming week. They're actually going to be doing their grand opening, I believe they said the weekend after the 4th of July, uh, which is going to be a recording weekend for us. We are going to record from there. Okay. So, cool. you know, if you're going to be around, we will be up there. We'd love to meet some people. Yep. Uh, stop on by. We're going to hang out, do a recording, and uh, who knows? Maybe we'll we'll talk to some gamers. Bring we're going we're gonna to be in their office It's again. the weekend after uh, the 4th. I don't know. It looks so know. cool in there. It's like it's, a, it's supposed to be a recording so studio. We, I mean, we may have to just because yeah. of the, the sound. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, we'll we'll see. And uh, Made me feel professional. It's the weekend <laughs> following the 4th of July weekend, correct? And as long as we can feel professional. That's yeah, right. After 4th of July. After 4th of July, okay. So, yeah, look for us then. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Brian's excited. Woo! Speaking of Brian, hey. what's Brian got for news? News. All right, guys, as always, our uh, news will have uh, links and descriptions on our website. Um, Dark Souls 3 art, basically they've sent out a bunch. It confirms an early uh, 2016 release for all you Souls fans, who I'm now a Souls fan after beating Bloodborne. It just is so worth it. Um, there are a lot of rumors already um, that it was coming out relatively quick, uh, but this kind of just confirms it's going to be uh, TBD quarter one, 2016. I'll uh, probably see some, uh, some, some videos, maybe even some gameplay at E3. Hoping so. Uh, but you never know. Mark, how are you, how are you feeling about it? I wanted to know if, uh, Bloodborne ties into the Dark Souls. No, they're, they're they're separate. Yeah, they're just spiritual successors. Now, obviously gotcha. Dark Souls three will be continuations of Dark Souls one and two. I am sure. But yeah, and you've played a little Bloodborne, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so after doing some reading online, apparently that's the easiest one. Yep, what? Of all of them. Yeah, woo. <laughs> yeah, and I've heard uh, that Bloodborne is more of a action oriented. Uh, basically, you swing, swing, swing. In in Dark Souls, it's all about keeping your shield up and waiting, and you know it's a lot more methodical. Right. Uh, of course, I own them all now. After beating Bloodborne, I figured I'd give From Software some love and check out their other. Uh, Demon Souls plus Dark Souls 1 and 2, so I can't wait to get into them. Um, next bit of news is about the Oculus. Oculus unveils their retail version of the Oculus Rift headset. Mark? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Man. I mean, I'm guaranteeing we're going to see a ton of e, uh, E3 stuff with VR. The The retail model of this, though, looks really, like, sleek. Yeah, it looks very comfortable. <clears throat> like, uh, it looks... Uh, I, you saw obviously you saw like the uh, the beta versions and stuff, right? A little bit more clunky. This looks like a just a bit thicker of a like you know how you put on one of those sleeping masks. Um, it's obviously a little bit more substantial than that, but it looks extremely sleek. It's got like a you know that uh, that matte black finish. Yeah, um, it looks lightweight too, which that's probably one of the most important things with a VR. You don't want to strap on a VR headset and then have your neck hurt after a while because yeah, it's definitely. so heavy. And the first models of it were huge and clunky. 
Um, so pretty exciting. I, I have a feeling that we're going to be seeing just a ton of like a Mo- Project Morpheus. I know Steam's doing their own. Yep. Uh, Valve's doing their own VR. So I think next this E3 th- is going to be the year of uh, VR. Well, I think the next couple of years we're really going to ramp up VR. Like, uh, but they've been saying it. that for months that it's going to be tons of VR. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they also showed that in the final version, there's going to be 3D position headphones so that you can get a real yep. sense of sound location. Yes. And also, this uh, retail version of uh, Mark, you'll appreciate this. Uh, in the article, it mentioned that it's going to be extremely more comfortable to wear with glasses. Good. Um, and that's something that they definitely had to address. Uh, what about people with giant heads? <clears throat> no. They said people with giant heads are freaks. Well... I've heard that before. They don't cater to freaks. Yeah. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, Yeah, so it's pretty exciting. Um, We'll have some more news about virtual reality coming up in the news, but uh, let's talk about some new product development. Uh, The May 2015 NPD uh, looks like PS4 overtook. uh, Xbox One actually won um, May, or I'm sorry, April. Actually had a big, big, big uh, month. Um the Witcher 3 obviously leads software sales. This is good. I mean, gaming keeps growing. Now, it's they're down from last year a little bit, but you have to remember uh, the console, the, the hardware sales are down, but you have to remember the console cycle. So we're, yeah. we're now into software mode. It's not m- as much hardware. Everybody's got one. People right. were dying for consoles last year. Yes. Yeah. And now we're into basically the software chugging along mode, um, and it looks good. I mean, in CD Projekt Red, their budget compared to their sales, I think it kind of put bigger studios on notice. Like, hey, we can make this. They think their budget was $35 million right. for the development and then another $35 million roughly for the advertising. So you've got a $70 million budget, which the game is one of the most beautiful I've played and one of the most massive I've played. And Just look at, looking at it, you'd assume it was like one of the more yeah. expensive games to make. Oh, and absolutely. And then you look at, you remember that the, the Destiny or Bungie saying Destiny, they had budgeted $500 million? Yeah. What? <laughs> like you look at that and you're well, like, they had to run the website. I mean, so people I'm, could read they, the lore. They didn't spend five hundred million. That was just their budget for the entire process, right? But you look at it like that, and then you you know, Grand Theft Auto. Granted, <clears throat> Grand Theft Auto sold in that the billions. Paid off. <laughs> it paid off, but they had a uh, they have a team that's twice the size of CD Projekt Red, and their budget was like two hundred fifty six million, right? So it just goes to show you that you next don't, time it'll be five twelve million. I think it goes to show you because you know how they've been saying that uh, you know. AAA titles are exponentially growing as far as the cost. Yeah. Um, well, I think CD Pro- The same thing happened with Metro Last Light, where they yes. made this really, really good-looking game for pretty cheap. Yeah, I, I, it just has to do with talent. You have to have the talent. You can just mass hire people and get it right through just sheer numbers, or you can get really talented people and sh- shut your numbers down. Yep. So, I mean, you're on notice, Mr. Developer. Yeah, Mr. Developer. <laughs> you tell him. Um... Square Enix, the next order of business is uh, a bunch of developers that have kind of thrown their uh, hat into the ring as far as development for Oculus Rift VR gaming. Uh, that includes Square Enix, so we're going to get a turn-based RPG. <laughs> I remember, JJ, you mentioned that, like how fun would it be to be on a VR with turn-based uh, combat? <laughs> It'd be weird. <laughs> it would really click. weird, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, the PS4, uh, the Order developer, they're they're throwing their hat in. Uh, let's see, we've got Ready at Dawn, uh, Harmonix, High Voltage Software, Sanzaru Games, and uh, more of all said, hey, VR, I think VR is the way of the future. And if you get good developers to develop for it, you're going to have a good time. Yeah. Look at what happened to the Kinect, right? <laughs> Microsoft didn't even yep. develop. Microsoft didn't even develop for it. You need the games to you, prove it's worth it. Correct. Yep. And when you get AAA developers saying this works so well that we want to actually develop for this, you have a really good, basically, base of confidence, by me at least. I want to point something out, too, uh, because you mentioned Square Enix, and I showed you this video yesterday. <laughs> There's a video on, uh, well, you can find it on YouTube. It's called, just look for Square Enix Presents E3 2015 Hype Video. If you haven't seen it already, I mean, it, it doesn't tell us much about what they're going to do. They give us just some really, really bare bones info, and they say, like, oh, we're going to talk about beep, and then it just, yeah. like, you know, bleeps out what they're going to say. Have you seen it? I have not. They don't say yeah, Brian. I'm agreeing Jeez. with you. Come on. Come on. He was saying, yeah, I'm listening. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
I just want to point something out. I'm not saying this is means anything, but when I heard it, it like gave me goosebumps. Listen to the music that's playing on that video. I don't know if that means anything, but listen to the music, and if you recognize it, you will probably get the same jitters that I got and be like, oh my gosh, oh dude, oh dude. I'm not going to say anything on the show, but I'm excited. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Me too. You you jerk. You (laughs) jerk. Without spoiling it, I bet it's just going to be some re-release. I have no doubt that you're probably right. It's probably going to be another Final Fantasy VII troll. I know. Something like that. But it's not, it's not Final Fantasy. It has nothing to do with Final Fantasy. Square Enix has hyped up this E3. They're, uh, I think they're going to come out swinging. I, I would say, would you guys agree that Square Enix has kind of been middling for a few years? They've kind of just kind of, they've had a couple good games, but they're kind of just kind They've of, become a much bigger studio. I mean, well, publisher, yeah. though. They own all of Eidos. Right. So they're going to be showing like Deus Ex, but they have mankind said, divided. They have said on multiple occasions that this E3 they're going to have huge announcements. Like this, they're they're hyping their, themselves up. They haven't done that in years past where they were they like haven't even done like a huge press conference. That's exactly right. So True. this should be an exciting. This E3 is starting to pique my interest. You know, I, I don't like hardware E3s. I hated the E3s with the new consoles because then it's all about them. This is the these are the E3s I love. What's all about the games? That's it. So, well, I think you're going to see a lot of hardware stuff this one too. Well, with VR, VR, but but <laughs> what you, what can't you have without VR? You can't have the, you have to have the games. No, absolutely. So it's not about the new consoles. Well, you, yeah, but you can make the same, and I agree with you 100. percent But you yeah. can make the same argue. What what can't you have without hardware? Well, games. right. <laughs> but we already know the hardware is existing. So actually, we, I take that back. You can TV apparently TV. you can have with hardware. Right. Perfect. Thank you, Microsoft. Perfect. Yep, way to go. Microsoft. All right, actually. Uh, I heard that Samsung TVs are going to be able to stream PlayStation Now. Mm-hmm. So really? uh, your joke is not, <laughs> it's 100% true. That's hilarious. Wow. Uh, and then if you guys are living under a rock, uh, the last bit of news is uh, Fallout 4 was revealed uh, last week. It's happening. Half-Life 3 confirmed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so dead to those jokes now. I think I we, we had a better chance of Fallout 4 coming, though, than Half-Life 3 coming. That's uh, 100% anytime correct. Anytime soon. So... Half Life Three has not been confirmed. It's not what he meant. He was just saying, joking. Nobody joke. is going when it actually is announced. People are just going to be They're not going to no, take it. I don't believe you guys. Half Life Three confirmed. Confirmed. Where's the joke? No, it's not no, a joke. It's Seriously. confirmed. <laughs> Here's some screens for it. Nah, that's just done film source Come maker, on. whatever. Jeez. Source filmmaker. That's just you're you're lying. <laughs> All right, we got a quick beyond the game segment. We are going to be talking about two days games versus old school games. Now. Regarding difficulty in games, is there a reason that hand-holding has become the norm in most of today's games? Like, you've got mini-maps, you've got quest icons, you've got uh, symbols that tell you where to go and who to talk to, you've got waypoints, uh, you've got teleportation, all this stuff that, that makes things a million times easier to get around and do things. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, there's no disputing that, that today's games are, in a lot of cases way easier to get through and, and more accessible for uh, for people. I wouldn't say today's gamers are spoiled. I would say that we, with our generation of games back then in the 90s, uh, there were just way too many limitations on games. Okay, so the games back then were, compared to today's games, unarguably much more basic. Yes. Much right. more basic. So you didn't have... So let's let's go through the progression here. You have basically the first games ever invented were side-scrollers. Very simple. You go one direction. You know where you're going because you can only go one direction, right? You don't need a mini-map for that. You don't need a tutorial. There's two buttons, jump and run, right? So that, that basically in itself is, okay, here's your tutorial. Just press buttons and you'll figure yourself out. Right. Then games escalated to have world maps, right? But those were still incredibly basic. There wasn't a whole lot of stuff on the map other than, like, here's a town, here's a town, here's a town, run to Exactly. A town. There wasn't anything of note other than right. exactly where you're supposed to go. Uh, and then fast forward to today's <laughs> games, and you've got games like Grand Theft Auto V, The Witcher 3, which are, if you didn't have a tutorial, and let's say you transported Young Mark to today's games, right? Young Mark just sitting there playing Final Fantasy VI. All of a sudden, you're transported through time to now, and you're playing The Witcher 3 or Grand Theft Auto V with no tutorial. You would not know what to do. There was That's too, probably there true. There was too much content in the game to not have a mini-map, or you'd be wandering around the city for hours and I think and hours. it's the the same way with like saving in games. First, first video games, there was no way to save. It was just technologically mm-hmm. impossible. Yep. They eventually were like, oh, we could have like passwords 
yep, where right. after you beat a boss, you earn a password, and you can type that in to start from that point. Eventually, they put batteries into the cartridges, and you were able to actually save your games. Yep. But it was still like probably super limited space, so it was pretty simple. Yep. And nowadays, most games you can just save whenever you want, no As matter Mark what. Would say save scum and save scum, yeah. And it totally does impact difficulty. Yep. Because in one game, in the past, you have to play the entire game in one sitting. Right. Yeah. Well, Meg- you- Mega Man. Think of Mega Man. There are no checkpoints in that game. So if you're playing a level and you get to the boss and you die, okay, actually, yeah, there were. The boss door was a checkpoint, right? Um, or did you have to start all yes. the way over? Okay. You no, know no, I'm pretty sure the boss door the boss was door. a checkpoint. But but if you die like right at the boss door before you get there, you start all the way over. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there were no there were no checkpoints. I think it's just all technological. I, I don't think I think the games if they could, they would have been more simplified for people to access. But they just weren't. I mean, you couldn't. But, but there, the were, there time, were games that had some of that stuff. I mean, right. I've got a Super Nintendo game. If you, anybody's ever played Seventh Saga, that game, you get an orb in the game that shows you where enemies are on the screen yeah. so you can avoid them or, or see them. I mean, there there was stuff like that. I mean, obviously it was limited and very, very smallish. But, I mean, there's a reason that people, the, the term Nintendo hard was, you know, brought out. Yeah. I mean, you know what Nintendo hard means. Yeah. It's like hard as it was back in the day. So, right. like, I've been playing Dragon Quest, and I can't even imagine today at today's game, like, somebody giving me a ship and saying, hey, there's this spot in the ocean that has this item that's really good. You should go find it without anything else. Right. And then I go search the entire freaking ocean, pixel by pixel, just pushing the button, just trying to find right. the, the correct spot. I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yep. I, and I think that games are much better now that they have these things in them. But it's also training us to be super lazy. So mm-hmm. that's the downside of it. Right. However, on the other hand, there is still an appetite for that old style of game, which is what Bloodborne proved. Bloodborne mixes the new school and the old school pretty well. Um, actually, pretty brilliantly, to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> there's still a checkpoint system, but you c- you don't really have a lot of them. But then you open up shortcuts, so it's through level design, which that kind of reminds me of the older games. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where and there's no tutorial. You just drop in and it's like, right. I guess I'll do stuff. Yeah, now, here's the thing, though. Do you think Bloodborne is popular because it's hard? Or, like, do you think that if there were tons of hard games just like that, it would just kind of be one of many? I think it would hurt because, it a little bit if because there were you more. Think, right. You think, you think about games back then. They were all super, well, not all, like, but what, for the most what part. What makes Bloodborne good is, well, I mean, there's all the different. stuff about the graphics and the story and all that. But it's also just that difficulty and that pride of learning how to play it yourself and it gives you the same pride you got when you beat a like a boss in mega man or a boss in zelda um what happens is you you're figuring it out yourself right you're not having the game tell you what to do you're yeah. like okay well i'm just gonna stumble into this oh my gosh i just stumbled into a boss room and i killed it that was you know it's all about the exploration and the uh i guess the endorphin rush of finding out what you're you know what you're doing on your own yeah. without a checkpoint system where you have to actually remember where I went. Like I felt in Bloodborne that I knew the area better than I do in some games with maps because I'm not really paying attention because I have a map. Right? But in Bloodborne you kind of map you have to map it out in your head because if you don't you're going to get mm-hmm. lost. So you, you I know um you know New Yarnum and and uh, uh Yargol the Unseen Village. I know it by heart because I had to. So makes sense. Yeah. And there are games like that from the past that are exactly the same where yeah. it's like I know exactly where to go. To find the secret character or right. whatever. Definitely. Do you think... I mean, this is not 100% on topic still, but do you think... Back then, games that were super hard, which were you know a really good chunk of them, uh-huh. you know, nobody really looked at as super hard, I don't think. At least in my experience. Nobody w- was like, oh man, have you played this game? It's super hard. Have you played this game? Well, it was just, have you played this game? And that was it. Right. Yeah. I, I think that Bloodborne is, you know, in the Soul series in general, is successful because it is got that super insane difficulty. I think if all games were like that nowadays and still that tough, it, I mean, there would be nothing really, I mean, not nothing special about it. It still would have its own flavor and stuff like that. But, I mean, I think it would it's be just, harder to stand out. Well, let's keep right. in mind, uh, and this is a that's a good point, but let's keep in mind that games back then, like Bloodborne, didn't have difficulty sliders. Now... You can play Skyrim on the hardest difficulty, and it is insanely hard. Yeah, that's true. Or you, but you can also play it on easy. So, <clears throat> excuse me, you can ask two people who played it on different difficulties. If Skyrim was easy and Skyrim was hard, you get two different answers. When back then, the game was just hard. 
Like you didn't have a the ability to say, I don't right. really want to play it on hard. Exactly. So, but that, and that right. brings us back to like, are we spoiled yes. nowadays? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, but simple it's, answer is we yeah. are spoiled, <laughs> but it is we are spoiled, but it is good that we are spoiled. Oh, I, right. I wholeheartedly right. agree. Believe me, I because I mean I'm still playing these old games. I just told you right. I'm using a freaking FAQ. Yeah. Because there's you no have way <laughs> I'm getting through that stuff, dude. And there, yeah. there are some times where it goes so far that it makes me roll my eyes. Like, and I hate to say anything bad about my favorite. Not my favorite, but Fable. The Fable series. Mm-hmm. In Fable 2, they introduced the breadcrumb trail, where uh, <laughs> basically you, you set a checkpoint, and it just has this sparkling like line that goes exactly oh, yeah. to where uh, you're supposed to go. Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite, same thing. Yeah. Yep. And uh, also, like if you die, you just you don't actually die. You just get knocked down yep. and eventually recover, and you lose nothing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Babies. Mm-hmm. Ridiculous. And yeah. it's interesting the way health has evolved in FPSs. Where in the past it used to be like a health bar, and when you run out of health, you're dead. And you have to go find health. Packs. And now it's oh, I've got my overshield, and yep. if you knock my overshield out, I can take one or two hits. <laughs> but if I take more, I die. But right. if I get behind cover and wait for four seconds, <laughs> right? If you if you're asking me, that that helped open up level design though, because uh, back then you had to remember to find areas to put health packs. I mean, but Valve didn't have any trouble with that. What do you mean? They were able to. Place those health packs That's perfectly true. in Half Life Two. Yeah, you're, you're it right. just requires more play testing. Yeah, true. And, I, and this is 100 percent not debatable. But I think with the uh, introduction of the internet, games have become stupid easy yeah. to, to yeah. navigate and get through. You know, obviously there's still going to be gameplay elements that are going to be difficult. Like Bloodborne, regardless of whether you have a guide in front of you, yeah. you're still going to have a tough time going through the motions and, and and doing all these attacks yourself. Oh yeah, but a game like, well, like Dragon Quest. Yeah. I back then I would have, I mean, I was a kid, so I would have just been like, nope, mm-mm, not happening. <laughs> pass. Doing this. Hard I don't pass. know where I'm going. I don't know what's going on. No. Right. But now I have a guide in front of me that tells me, you know, where to go next and what to do, and I'm like, all right, I'll do this. And I, you know, I only look at it when I need to. Um, and in those games, typically when I use a guide, it's for, uh, f- like, a if I'm stuck, or b if I need a boss strategy. There's no boss strategies because there's no bosses except for the end boss, uh, which later in Dragon Quest games there are. But the first two, there have not been any bosses other than the, the final boss. And so the only thing I've really needed it for is just to figure out where to go next. I spend most of the game literally just sitting there watching TV, laying on my couch, grinding. Yep. And that's yep. it. So, I don't know. I mean, those were the glory days, man. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's ruined, like, secrets in games, too. I Like, uh, in, in an old game... You could beat the game and be like, oh, I, I guess I did everything. And maybe there's a secret you never found. Yeah. But now a new game is like, what are these two uh, achievements that are blocked that I don't have? Right. I better I go and look and it you up. Go look it up. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I, I shouldn't say those are the glory days because, like I said, I prefer the way we have it now because I like, A, a I like that accessibility. I like everybody being able to yeah. jump in, you know, and, and having tutorials and all this stuff and people being able to just play games the way they want to play them mm-hmm. rather than just being thrown this cartridge with, you know, like, here it is. Have yeah. fun. Oh my gosh. I don't know what I'm doing. Right. But at the same time, I, I think it's also kind of something to be said about, yeah, I lived through that and I got a chance to play those games when they were in their prime. Definitely. And there were games that I went through and figured out on my own. Well, we were, I would consider us second generation gamers. We weren't first generation. First generation was the Atari, uh, people who just picked up gaming, but we were second generation gamers and now we're on to, you know, third and fourth generation gaming, and it's just the fir- you know first and second generation gamers kind of pioneering the gaming industry, uh, and now it's kind of opened up that bottleneck into wide mainstream, which has a yeah. lot to do with accessibility. And I think know. I think this is a, another big reason why esports are becoming so big. Mm-hmm. Like anybody can play a single player game, and you know anybody can beat it. Yes, there are challenges you can do, like oh, I'm not going to go through the entire game without equipment, or yeah, yeah I'm going to go through without using magic, or blah blah blah, whatever. But you're still going to play the game beginning to end. You're going to beat it and be done. Esports let you actually measure your level of skill with someone else's on an evil, evil, even playing field. Well, some games evil playing evil field. Evil playing yeah. field. Uh, but you actually get to test your metal against them. And, yeah. you know, some people, that's not their thing. I'm god-awful, but I have a good time doing it. <laughs> yeah. And you know what they say, what's the most dangerous game? Other humans. Yeah, <laughs> I guess they say that. Yep, they do say that. That applies. Okay, 
You guys have anything else to add? No, I think that was nope. a good discussion. All I right. I think uh, we, we filled it. Top five. We are talking about... You know what? I was actually surprised because this list was hard for me to do because there were a handful. Well, you I don't like uh, side-scrollers. Top five side-scrollers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I am not a huge fan of them, but the more I thought about it, I was like, God, man, there's so many great games that were side-scrollers, though. Yeah. And my number one is a recent game. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Well, anybody get any honorable mentions? Uh, Super Mario Brothers 3. Okay. Absolutely. C- great one. Uh, Mark of the Ninja. Actually, a more recent one. Uh, Steam uh, indie game. I would say I would say the Super Mario Brothers series in general. Yeah. You know, for the most part. <laughs> Donkey Kong Country as well. Uh, Ninja Gaiden. Yeah. Was hard. always was always solid. Very hard. Hard. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Nintendo hard. Yeah, Nintendo hard. <laughs> Um, and uh, TMNT. Uh, I'd say Turtles in Time, probably the best version. Uh, yeah, would that really be a side scroller? I mean, it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're just moving up and down, right? It's got. Yeah, it still would because you're still going left to right the whole time. Double sure. Dragon, Double Dragon, definitely. Double Dragon. Yeah, there are a lot classic. of them. Definitely yeah. a lot of them. And most of them are going to be old school mm-hmm. type stuff. I mean, we'll just say freaking Nintendo in general. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's get us, get it started. I will start off. Okay. I don't think I've started in a while. My number five, side scroller, Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo. I honestly, I think Super Mario Three is a better game, but Super Mario World is like just because of of how big of a leap forward it was when it first came out. And that Super yeah. Nintendo game, I beat this game so many times. Yoshi. And getting that getting that Star ninety six, if you've ever played it. Uh, when you're you're trying to, you know, unlock all the secrets and everything like that, and you get all 96 stars on there. That is the coolest thing in the world. It's the best feeling just because it looks a little different and it shows up right on your main screen there. Mm-hmm. It's so cool. Kind of a badge of honor. First time I ever found Torpedo Land. Oh man, that was so cool. Gosh, that game brings back memories. Uh, but I mean, you got Yoshi. You had an epic boss fight at the end. It wasn't just you know jump on him, right? And that was it. <laughs> uh, but it was like, man, Super Mario World. Great game. Ghost houses, collecting items, fun stuff. Absolutely. All the mini bosses. Mark number five. My number five is Limbo. That was originally an exclusive to Xbox. I think it's on PC now as well. Uh, this is, you have played it? I have on Steam. I played it and beat yeah. it. It's fantastic. It's a, it's a really good game. It's basically the art style is this really dark. Uh, that's not the music of Limbo, just FYI. Oh, well, that, that is the Limbo music, isn't it? No, Limbo's a little bit more dark than that, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> so so it's basically the art style is like silhouettes-based, where it's just really dark backgrounds, and you see outlines of stuff, and uh, you're basically trying to get back to your... Is it your sister that got separated from you? Yeah. You're going through this horrible uh, environment where there's giant spiders chasing you, and... Crazy parasites that take over your body, stuff like that, and it's a really cool game. There's some awesome mechanics where you can like literally rotate the entire world, mm-hmm. and all the physics objects in the world react to that. This and, would definitely uh, be in my top ten. Yeah, if we had a top ten. Yep, it's just a perfect metal, uh, melting mixing of style and interesting gameplay concepts. Yeah, cool. Brian number five. Uh, my number five is Contra 3 Alien Wars for the Super Nintendo. My brother and I, I think all three, actually both of my brothers and I played the crap out of this game. I think we rented it every time we went to Blockbuster. It had, I think my, my brother and I, uh, my brother Kyle and I are really big, um, we're really big, what's the word I'm looking for here, Terminator fans. And it's got a very Terminator feel, feel to it uh, with the, uh, you know, the skull boss that comes out of the wall. And it all has that like futuristic, you know, um, future Terminator War and made Contra. Um, obviously, I played Contra for all the NES and you know Super Contra for... I played all the Contras before, but that this was the first one that actually... The graphics were better. Um, the, I thought the co-op was better in Contra 3 Alien Wars 2. The, the bosses were a little bit more varied and uh, fun. Because wasn't Contra... Wasn't the uh, first Contra the game where you went into the little... The bosses were in the like the, the, the little corridor? Uh, they had a few... Like two levels two that were like that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, do you have to use the Konami code ever? I don't. I do remember thinking. I think we cheated on Contra Three. I can't. I mean, it's been so long. I just know we beat it. We didn't. 
But uh, I you know can't, we, you can't cheat on Contra Three. It doesn't have the Konami code. We I think we game genie did it then because I remember yeah. having Infinite Lives. Yeah. Yep. Game genie. Yep. I know yeah. we did something to make it easy. Yeah, I was I was reading up on it because I uh, well we'll keep moving. My number four is Contra, the first one. Yeah. Um, and honestly, nostalgia, obviously, but uh, the it was the first game that I ever played with the Konami code, and I had no idea that it was called the Konami code or that it was even would even carry over to other games. I just remember any time I went over to my grandparents' house, they had a Nintendo, and they had Contra, and my cousin Mike and I would sit there and play it for hours trying to beat it. But good lord, we could never ever beat the thing regular. We always had to put in. The code. Oh, yeah. Hard. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, select, start. And you would only hit select if you were doing two players. But, anyways, so it was it was the first game that I remember with the Konami code, and that's a big reason. I mean, the game itself is amazing. The whole Contra series is really, really mm-hmm. good if you like side-scrollers. Just action-packed, and it's just dudes going in there and blowing up stuff with sweet very, guns. Very Rambo-esque. Yep, that's all it is. Yep. And, uh... Yeah, there was, man, if anybody has beaten that game, that's another example of, you know, how hard games were back then. If anybody's beaten the original Contra with the three lives that you get. No. Oh, my gosh, dude. No. Seriously. <laughs> not happening. Ugh, not for me, anyways. No. Uh, yeah. But great game, nonetheless, and uh, brings back a heck of a lot of memories. Contra. I did find out later on because I was curious and I was just a dumb kid. I got Ninja Turtles for my Game Boy, and I decided to try putting in the code, and it gave me thirty dollars. Thirty dollars. Nice, sweet. <laughs> nice. I gotta go get that game right <laughs> yeah. now. I can use uh, thirty bucks, and it gave me thirty lives. And I was like, uh, wait, "Wait, this works on other games too?" And then, you know, when internet, uh, I found out that it was like, "Oh, it's actually quite yeah. a few games that have this because it worked on uh, Gradius Three. What if it works well. on Turtles in Time, or was that not Konami?" Uh, I do not know. I, I don't even remember Turtles in Time. I didn't play it that much, to gotcha. be honest with you. But uh, actually, another side school that was a good honorable mention, Gradius 3, if you haven't played yeah. that. Very, very good game. And the Sonic series, obviously. Yep, definitely. Yep. Mark number four. My number four is Braid. This is a really special game to me Great because uh, this was like one of the first games that came out at like the beginning of the new indie game revolution. It was this and Audio Surf were like the first two that became really big hits and kind of paved the way for everything else. And this is a cool game where it's it's a side scroller. Obviously, has some like Super Super Mario Brothers feel to it, like with the art design mainly. But you control time in this, in like I think there's four separate ways that you control time in each world that you go to. There's also an interesting story where you're trying to save a princess and she's always in another castle. But there's a huge twist on that at the end of the game that I won't spoil. And there's hidden stuff, like really interesting hidden stuff. Like there's, in the first level in the game, there's this tiny cloud up in the corner at the farthest end of the map. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's not moving. looks like it's just sitting there. It's moving. And if you can get up on that and you just sit there on that cloud for like four hours, it'll go to the other side of the map and there's a secret door that you can go into that gives you some interesting insight on the story. Very cool. Wow. Yeah, I've heard very good things about Braid. I wish I could play it. You can. It's on Steam. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I remember playing it when, uh, or not playing it, but I, I've I watched your brother play it when we were living together. And, yeah. uh, I mean, beginning to end, that game was just, it, first of all, the music was really, really good. Yes. But the uh, just the art style and, and the puzzles were so well designed with the whole time travel aspect. Not necessarily time, I, would, I should say time control, I guess is a better way to put it. Yeah. But uh, it's... Just a really, really cool, fun little game. Yep. Yep. Brian, number four. My number four is Mega Man X for the Super Nintendo. You guys will notice a thread here that uh, I don't like bad graphics, and I didn't like them back then. So, obviously, Mega Man games are classics, but, uh, man, Mega Man X really upped the ante. I listened to the uh, opening uh, after I put put this list together. I was like, oh, man, I want to listen to the opening theme of Mega Man X, and good gosh, man. I mean, say what you will about MIDI music on the you know eight bit uh, NES, but that sixteen bit MIDI, whoo! Uh, Mega Man X, they were the first game to uh, do the the upgrades where you could they're super hidden. Um, the the suit upgrades where you could you know you look like normal Mega Man at the beginning of the game, and then you get these like power up armors that had like you know the slide boots and the uh, the the wall grabbers and the the, the big Buster shot. Um, thought it was really cool. Mega Man X, uh, that whole series is probably uh, one of my favorites. Uh, like I love Mega Man, don't get me wrong, but 
Mega Man X really, uh, really, you know, p- you know, made the made the did a good job. <laughs> I think the title is very well deserved. Like, it's like when what back they don't do it anymore because obviously it's it's way past. But like back in the the late eighties, early nineties, if they came out with the product, uh, they would call it the blah 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 two thousand. Right. You know, like yeah. Mega Man X. If you played Mega Man one, two, three, and four. Mega Man X was just like Mega Man on freaking crack. It was oh, just yeah. amped up, had so much more you could do, looked incredible. It was cool. Yeah. The bosses were all animal themed. Yep, yep. Yep. And moving on, my number three, Mega Man 2. Nice. My favorite game in the series. I adore this game and uh, have so many good memories with it. The music, the difficulty... Oh my god! Yeah, like, and the thing is, I got to a point where I could play through all the actual boss fights, no problem. Doctor Wily's castle, though, the dragon on the little oh blocks. What gosh, are they like, thinking? Oh, it is <laughs> so annoying. Like, I mean, when you when you finally beat it and you're done, it's such an accomplishment. Right. If you've done that, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But man, it's just ugh, Nintendo hard. It, Again. Yep. Do you know? Uh, you know, one of the things about Mega Man that uh, I remember the discovery of it when I was a kid. I didn't ever know about it, but uh, the boss weaknesses to certain other bosses, um, mm-hmm. uh, ammunition, because you, as you know, in Mega Man, you gain the boss's ammunition that you kill. Uh, you kind of incorporate what they use. You and didn't know that as a kid? I, I, I discovered it as a kid oh. when I was playing, I think, Mega Man 2, in fact, when I got Sawman's Blades, mm-hmm. and then I went over to Woodman, and just, yeah, like, I literally, I remember <laughs> shooting the saw, and him, him, his health getting chunked to, like, a quarter, or, like, a quarter of his health. And I was like, Whoa! Yep. So then I try, you, you have the experimentation of, oh, okay, what boss, oh, I bet Waterman and Fireman or something related. I love that aspect to it. Just look, something Absolutely. Just, you can beat the game without doing that, but it helps immensely go, okay, what's the order of bosses I need to do? That was that was another reason I liked it so much, is Me- and, and this obviously started with Mega Man 1, but the Mega Man series in general gave you a sense of freedom in that you yeah. weren't be yeah. like, you couldn't be like, I'm on level 1 or I'm on level 2. It was, who have you beaten so far? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And because you could do it at any point. You know, your friend could have beaten three bosses on the left side of the screen while you've beaten the three bosses on the right side of the screen. And you're like, well, these guys are easier. And he's like, no, those guys are easier. It was one of the first games where you felt like you had a toolbox and you were adding stuff to it constantly throughout the game. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great, great series in general. Uh, Mark, number three. My number three is Mega Man 3. (laughs) Wow, Mega Man. Which is, is, I found out, KG Inifun's least favorite in the series. <laughs> oh boy. But it's the one that we owned and the one that I played the most. Right. I mean, I've played the other ones. You know, what were some of the bosses the... in that one? I, I'm trying to remember. I know I've played God, it. I don't, I don't remember. Come on. Oh. man. No, that was two. The guys you were talking about there. No, that was two. I don't know, man. Come on. I remember that Dr. Wily man? was pretending nope, to be... Nope, that was two. Yep. I remember that Dr. Wily was pretending to be a good guy and he was working along with Dr. White. You know, I uh, I have... Dr. Dr. Light. Bright. Dr. Light. Dr. Light. You know what you guys ought to do for just a nostalgia boost? If you go on to Amazon, you can get the uh, Mega Man uh, Anniversary Collection for the PS2. It's got everything 1 through 8. And you can also get the Mega Man X uh, Anniversary Collection. It's got yeah. 1 through 6. I have it on Amazing. YouTube. This is, uh, Same thing. This is yep. the first Mega Man that incorporated sliding into it, ah. which was super cool. I do remember that. Yeah. 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 And you also got Rush for the first time. You mm. could transform into like a spring or a, like a jet you could fly along on. Oh, that red doggy. Yeah, dude. Yep. And it also had Breakman in it, who's like this nemesis of yours who shows up and you have to fight him constantly throughout the game. And at the very end of the game, as you're about to die, he shows up and saves you. And you find ah, out he's your brother. I do remember that. Thank you. I was trying to remember the game. But he's your uh, brother, Proto Man. Proto Man. Proto Man. Uh, I just want to point out, I just looked it up. And yeah, if you're going to get the anniversary collection, get it for the PS2 because that one's it's cheap. on Amazon, twelve ninety nine. Yeah. And the GameCube one is like 80 bucks. Yes. <laughs> but I've got that one because I'm awesome. Boom, collectors. Uh, but I bought it when yeah. it first came out. Yeah, so. So, I've got them both. Can't wait to dive in. Maybe this is the worst one in the series. You have them both? No, I have Mega Man uh, anniversary collection and Mega Man X anniversary collection oh, 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 for gotcha. the PS2. I just liked this game because I was a kid and robots were super cool. Oh, absolutely. Right, right, JJ? Yeah. Aren't I robots mean, cool? I mean, no, doing robots. a side-scroller top five, everyone knew Mega Man was going to be on there. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the fathers of side-scrolling. I hate steampunk and I hate robots. Robots are cool. My favorite game is steampunk and my second favorite game has <laughs> robots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny stuff. All right. Brian, number three. 
Uh, my number three is actually Spawn the video game. I've talked about this before, previous on the podcast. I'm a huge uh, Todd McFarlane slash Spawn uh, fan. This is one of the lesser known games on the Super Nintendo. Uh, probably not even considered the best. Um, I just remembered a boss, Bubble Man. No, he was number. He was two. No, he's in three. All right, go ahead. Okay, anyway, you might be right. Um, Spawn the video game. One of the hard aspects of it, obviously, was Nintendo hard back then. Super Nintendo. Um, something about Spawn Universe is once he uses up his power, he dies. So you have these powers in this game. It's a side scroller. Yeah, it's He's two. In two. I figured it was two. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> um, you had these powers, and if you use up all your power throughout the game, you die. So literally, you had to really be careful. And that just like Spawn, you know, in the comic in the show, uh, he couldn't use his power at will because he had to, he has limited reserve. Um, but man, the bosses in the game, you're fighting against Malbolgia, you're, you know, you got the Violator and all that stuff. All the, all the big characters make cameos. It was fantastic. It was a very, very side scroller game, very hard, like you would imagine. Um, and, uh, kind of lesser known spawn the video game. Number three. All right. Number two, my number two, Castlevania symphony of the night had to be on one of our lists. I absolutely love this game. And I, I'm not the biggest Castlevania fan, yeah. uh, and I chalk that up to just not having played through a lot of them. But when I heard that one was coming out, I knew the series had been you know around for a while and, and that it was huge and stuff. But when I heard they had one coming out that was going to incorporate like leveling up experience, you had to try uh, it items, new equipment, all this stuff, I was like, I got to try it out. Sure enough, I did it and I was not disappointed. And you know, this would have sure for sure been on my list if I, I this was a, I watched my brother play a game so. <laughs> Uh, can't I can't put a list a game on my list that I haven't played so but yeah, it, I yeah. Mean. and you get the, the crazy thing is you get to you you can beat it a certain way and then the game's done but if you play it a certain another way you get to the quote unquote halfway point and then all of a sudden the entire castle gets inverted and you play through it again mm-hmm. with everything like flipped upside down it's interesting yeah. But it's yeah, I, I absolutely adore that game, and the music is so good. Very oh good. my gosh, for, for, it's for amazing. PlayStation, they could actually use like live tracks and real music, so it's very very, very good. good. Uh, that's another one that I would like to revisit eventually yeah, at some point. Absolutely. Mark number two. My number two is Shadow Complex. You guys played Shadow Complex? Nope, nope. This is an Epic Games published game uh, from the Mustard Brothers. Nice. The, Do they like ketchup? They I, they might. But the Mustard Brothers are the guys who made the Advent Rising, not trilogy because it got canceled. Oh God, I was so upset <laughs> when it got canceled. That game was so good. Um, yeah, but this is a this is like a total throwback to the old Metroidvania style games. They actually brought on Orson Scott Card as a plot writer for the game. Oh wow! And it's it's just got really good graphics. I think they used the Unreal Engine on it. Yeah. Um, it came out recently. Recently, like two thousand six or two thousand seven, yeah. I think. Yep, that's a guess. So it's a um, newer two. It's a newer side scroller. Yeah, yeah. And it had your typical upgrades like double jump, grapple, stuff like that. But it also had really cool stuff like the friction dampeners, which were these boots you could put on, and you could start running. And if you had like a, a flat surface, you'd eventually start running at like sonic speed and just like shoot across the map. Well, yeah, that's never been in a game before. Super Metroid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's better than this. Is it? No. I was going to say. <laughs> it's also got the... Uh, hold on. <laughs> I have to look at my notes. Okay. It's also got the inertial element magnetic rifle, which is just this awesome like matter gun that shoots and destroys everything. So, cool game. Uh, check it out. Nope. Not going to do it. You, you I'll pr- probably check should. it out. It sounds good. I'll probably do, do that. <laughs> I'll probably do. I'll probably do. Brian, number two. My number two is Dust and Elysian Tale. This truly is a newer side-scroller game. This game, I recommend it 100%, even if you don't like side-scrollers. The music alone is the best I've ever heard in a side-scrolling game. I was absolutely like taken back by how beautiful the game was and how like, atmospheric the music was. Um Pretty simple side scroller, very Metroidvania esque, where you're going. You, do, you don't have just one path. You've got many different. You know, it's a big map, and you can pick places to go. But man, Dust and Legion Tale is definitely worth a buy in a play if you like side scrollers, or if, even if you don't play it. Or else, I will be not friends with you. <laughs> well, there you have it. The music alone is worth the buy. Uh, it's something that I've been curious about. I just haven't uh, haven't dove into it. And I honestly, considering what my number one is, I probably should check it out. 
because uh, I think I would imagine it'd probably be in the same same vein. Yep. So number ones, my number one is Child of Light. I absolutely adored this game. It is, it's a fairy tale that you are just playing, and it is it just brings back like when you heard those stories as a kid. And the way you felt, and you're like, oh my god, dude, like, magic and, you know, knights and castles and blah blah blah, all this other stuff, and just a whole fantasy world. The way they tell the story, in incorporation with the music, and the characters that you get, the battle system is turn-based, which obviously is awesome. Right. Uh, but the, uh, the it, I don't know that there's anything bad that I can say about this game that, that would ever make me question recommending it to somebody. If you've not played Child of Light, you're missing out. I mean, simply put, do it and do yourself a favor. It's on my 100%. Back, it's on my backlog for sure. Child of Light, yep. number one. My number one. And my number one. Is the same as Brian's number one. And I guarantee because, you. Because I, he guilted me into changing it. I, know, I guarantee you if, you if you have played it and or you know you know what's coming, Mark. It's, it's uh, Echo the Dolphin. Yes, Echo the Dolphin for the uh, <laughs> Game Gear. For the Game Gear, nonetheless. No, it is Super Metroid. Um, widely considered Nintendo's best game ever. Yeah. Um, honestly, uh, there was an article that I read about it that this is the most technically sound, best designed world of any game ever made. Um, now that's hyperbole, but when they when the, the article that was written said that this game, I mean, this game spawned a revolution in gaming. Um. I mean, talk. I mean, talk about. Yeah, it a bit. Uh, this is the third Metroid game right. in the series. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This was the one that came out on the Super Nintendo, yeah. and it definitely shows. I mean, the graphics are so much better yeah. than the old. Not that the old games look bad, but right. the graphics are so much better. Uh, the music is just beautiful. Yeah, and uh, it's a hard game. It's it's a hard game. It's a game that requires you know memorization and thought and like oh man remember that that yellow door that i saw at the very beginning of the game yes. now that i have the bombs i should go try that out and that's one of my favorite things about right. metroidvania in general but this is like this is the game that does it best it, oh absolutely that, that feeling of having to go back to familiar places to find unfamiliar new locations correct the boss fights were absolutely for the time beyond epic uh remember standing on that big yes. the, the big one's arm um mm-hmm. and then uh i won't spoil anything but the ending the end boss fight where Everyone knows at this point. I yeah, mean, I mean, anything? I mean, the the the, the screams and the, like the, the sound of that. I just, I still to this day it gives me goosebumps when you are about to get your eye, you know the, the the mother brain's eye starts to 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 charge up and you're about to get shot dead and then your yeah. your the little Metroid you saved at the very beginning of the game boom flies in he's big now just starts sudden the sound you you remember you remember the sound it gives you goosebumps when you remember the the screams and the the alien nature of it oh my goodness and you get the powered up shot and it just rocks its head back yeah i mean everything about this game go ahead no i, well, I'm I don't want to interrupt you in the middle of a sentence <laughs> no i'm gushing just my, I, just, I just have a, a i'm rambling basically pointless question was mother brain first or was the brain thing from the tmnt series first krang 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 which one was first krang uh, krang I probably no i don't know oh, i mean well either way that was a creepy like thing that started like weird anthropomorphic brains i mean super creepy sit me sit somebody down and have them play that game and i mean i know for the time it's obviously not the best graphic game anymore but i would like them to point out a flaw in that game because if it did have some yeah. it was extremely few that's how good that game was if the pacing was brilliant, the world was brilliant, the level design was brilliant, the music was brilliant, the sound was brilliant. I'm mean, widely considered Nintendo's best ever game. I mean, it's you, like the peak. You, you play a song from that game right away. And I need I immediately need to start playing it. Yep. Never played it before. <laughs> it's it's it. widely considered Nintendo's best game they've ever made and 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 you should definitely I have not. I own it. I yeah. haven't I just haven't gotten to it yet. Yep. Cuz I've never been a huge Metroid fan, sure. but at the same time, like I can't deny like this game especially you know, and I also want to get into the Prime series as well. It, it's so. one of those games, it's one of those Half Life games that revolutionized shooters. It's, it's one of those yeah. that sent ripples through the, through you know, through the uh, future of gaming that shaped this through Metroid, the gamosphere. Metroidvania is a category of game now, and that's yep. And this is the father of them all. Oh, it was so creepy that game. Metroidvania, Metroid, Super oh, Metroid, Super Metroid. Just the the bosses, the so eeriness creepy. of the game. Yeah, was the was ugh, I could gush about it for hours, but uh, yeah, Super Metroid is definitely my number one side scroller. 
There you have it. Anybody got anything else? I really don't, other than I just want to point out that... Uh, Is that what you wanted to point out? Oh, yeah. That makes sense. I like to troll. Oh, boy. Well, with that, I think this is it for episode number 64. We are excited for E3 this week. Very. Oh, man. Yeah, you guys have something special planned. Mark, yeah. Mark and I got uh, tickets to go to the uh, PlayStation Experience out here in Kansas City. So we'll be there. It's going to be a good time. Be yeah. there or, or be square. Which uh, we'll get to see the uh, press conference as it's happening on the uh, big old movie screen. Yeah, that'd be cool. That's pretty exciting. Hopefully, one day get to actually go to E3, and ooh, that should be sweet. That'd be really cool. This is kind of a little taste of it, though. But we're getting a PlayStation surprise, uh, allegedly. Yeah, I don't know what it is or what. We'll find out. Morpheus? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably gonna be some like one of their B games. I, I it's probably like a, a skin or something on your <laughs> on your console. Get the PlayStation like Experience a theme. Yeah. We'll see, though. I mean, you know what? Honestly, that's the, the least of what I'm excited for. I am just so stoked to see... It's all about the spectacle. The new yeah. stuff. Yeah. And what's coming out. Uh, in our next episode, we are going to be talking E3 big time. Mm-hmm. So, look forward to that. And anybody else got anything else? Nope. All right, with that, this is... is this, 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 Rewind it. Rewind what it. This, this. this is the Frozen North signing off for episode number 64. My name is JJ. My name is Mark. And me, Nombre Brian. And as always, keep on gaming. Our theme song was made available through the Creative Commons Attribution License by Ziphoid. The song title is Radical Fanfare.